Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for being in the REC experience. I'm your host, Jazz Tacker, with your girl, Laura Elto Stewart. What's going on? Hey, Jazz. So what a day. It's been what a day, what a past couple of days um, at the time of this recording. It's Monday. You'll be hearing this obviously today uh, being Wednesday. We're a couple of days into semi shutdown mode in the city, the country, globally uh, for COVID 19. Um, yeah, we're waiting to hear Prime Minister's thoughts on it at one o'clock today. At one so o'clock this is today. Before that. This is before that. Um, I mean, I hope wherever you are, if you're listening to this or you're watching this, that you're staying safe. First and foremost, um, we say it all. We say it here all the time. Like even when things are really, really good, is that family and health is it, it really is a, a, on its own pedestal. Um, but now at, at, at this time. Um, I hope that wherever, again, you're listening and watching this, that your families are safe and you're safe and you're quarantining yourself if that's what you need to do, whatever you need to do to stay safe. Yeah, and I guess most importantly, regardless of your thoughts, how you feel on the issue, uh, just be mindful of people who are at risk, the elderly. Yes. The young ones. For sure. They for don't sure. They have the, the same type of immune system. So Look, let's just be cautious of if that you need and to, check in on them. And great point. And if you need to go get food and stock up, uh, stock up. I mean, this is just coming from, this is not necessarily my opinion on things, but it's coming from the doctors. It's coming from our leaders now who we have to look at in our country, prime minister, uh, mayors. They're saying, look, stock up for a couple of weeks where you don't necessarily need to stock up for um, uh, uh, seven months, months and months on and end. Yeah. Because there is people that actually need yeah. some of like, so think the about supplies, the community at right? Large, right? G- exactly. Yeah. Um, look, we 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 started this podcast to bring positivity to people's lives in whatever wh- whatever manner that we could, and so um, trying just kind of shifting now and pivoting. Um, if you are. Uh, going to continue to listen to this episode and watch this episode. <laughs> you probably have some extra time on your yeah, hands. So exactly. Go back, Ex- listen to some old episodes. Back. We would love for you to do that and get some education. I'm getting a lot of calls myself. Laura, you are as well. Uh, Simos is getting a lot of calls about just invest investments that people are getting themselves into, like they're actually in contract, as well as ones that they were thinking about making. You guys have heard me enough on this podcast, anyone new, um, look, if we go back to, to, to SARS and we go back to um, with what happened with H1N1, um, even as far as back as, as September 11th, mm-hmm. um, lot, a lot, it, in terms of real estate, values always came back up again. Yeah. And, and as long as this, this disease and, 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 and this virus doesn't wipe us off the planet, I think it's safe to say, now this is my opinion, it's safe to say that people are still going to need places to live, mm-hmm. and that means end users, families, yeah. as well as tenants, someone who just wants to live close to, like, you know, Keegan, videographer of ours, he needs a place to live, yeah. and he's renting right now. And he's going to continue to rent. Yeah. Right. Um, And so if you buy something or you're in an investment, just make sure that you think about it long term and then make your decision. What do you always say about not making rash decisions? in? Oh, don't make long term decisions in short term emotions. I love it. Say it again. Don't make long term decisions based off of short term emotions. And we're not saying that this is like some type of promo to buy real estate or not. like just I want you to think about it from that perspective. Yeah, chances are this is probably and hopefully knock on wood temporary. Um and these things have happened in the past yep. and what's going and what we're seeing with mortgage rates, I mean, the spring market had already sort of started here in the city of Toronto. We already have a sh- uh, a housing crisis, a shortage of homes and this assuming that this is just sort of a couple months delay, then there's going to be um, an interesting opportunity after that is all said and done with, just given how cheap uh, money is to borrow and that everyone's going to be coming back into the market all at the same time. Uh, So once we get that consumer confidence, you know, I think we'll start to see things heating up again. And uh, again, that might be a very interesting and unique opportunity for a lot of people. Today and, and, and this past weekend, I think I probably got about 22 calls from investors saying, Jazz, like, please find us an investment property because we know how this is going to play out. Yeah. Um, again, that doesn't mean that you need to do the same, but just to give you an idea of some guys who and gals that are very, very savvy and been through this before, they know because what 
you mentioned too, Toe, that that interest rates are so low, money is very, very cheap, the cost of borrowing yeah. is very low right now, that this is the time to, for lack of a better word, and no pun intended, really hoard some investments. <laughs> Right? Like this might be that time yes. to at least look at some of the opportunities. Yes. And that's that's good hoarding. Yes. Um, <laughs> this podcast, shout out to Costa from Top Agent Podcast. He had me on as a guest to talk about uh, really and, and go further into detail what we just spoke about, about the the, the macro strategies that, that I talk about and that I personally invest in when it comes to real estate, which you guys know it's buy and hold. But I really dove into why I think Toronto is still one of the safest places to invest in. Um, obviously, Canada in, in, in a whole. Um, at the time of that recording, when I did this with Casa last week, rates didn't get slashed yeah. a couple of a times. A lot's changed in a very a short period of time. It has. Yeah. It has. Um, and so, uh, again, huge, huge shout out to Costa. Great host. Thanks for having me on, my man. Um, and guys, as always, leave us the comments. Leave us the feedback. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And do some of these. Give me your album. Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> no fish Social distancing. Today. It really is the main thing. Elto, thanks for doing everything you do for us. You, you stay safe. Keep your family safe. Keep Rudy safe. Because I don't know how it's affecting dogs and pets and stuff, but nobody really knows. But keep them safe. I will. I will. I'll be social, socially isolating myself right next to my dog. So. Awesome. It's all good. Enjoy the show, guys. Oh, good job. What best. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, I'm used to that. Je- <laughs> I'm Hold a on. hunger too. Hold on. I'm a hunger, it's really hard. REC Experience presents Real Estate Entrepreneurship Leadership with your host, Jazz Tackar. The REC Experience Podcast is now on air. All right, Jazz, thank you so much for joining me on the Top Agent Podcast. I was really excited for you to be here. Thank you uh, for having me, Costa. Really, really appreciate it, man. And I, and I love the name of the podcast, Top Agent <laughs> Podcast. So Thank I guess I'm, I, I, I'm lucky enough to be a top agent, so I appreciate 100%. that. 100%. <laughs> so you're the, you're the co-founder of the REC team, um, which is the number one Royal Page team in Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, so we're under the uh, Royal LePage uh, banner. So there's 18,000 realtors right across uh, the country. It's uh, Royal LePage has been around for coming up to a little over 110 years now. A.E. LePage um, started this. And uh, myself and my business partner, uh, Simos or Simeon Papayilius, uh, him and I have a team of uh, 25 realtors and 10 support staff. And uh, last year in 2019, we were awarded uh, the number one team in the country. And so we did a little over 700. uh, We helped over 700 buyers, sellers and investors last year. That's huge, man. Congratulations. That's Thank quite you. the achievement. Now, it's been um, now 15 years in the making. So this is wow. not an, you know, it, it, we're definitely not an overnight success. It takes yeah. it's a lot of time, patience and hard work. Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot I want to ask you, a lot I want to get into, but um, do you mind just kicking things off by just telling the audience a bit about yourself and how you got into real estate? Yeah, look, I love long walks on the beach and no, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, as a 12 year old knew that, uh, I, I probably wasn't going to stick with school for a very long time. Um, I couldn't wait to get out of class or come into a, come into the classroom, ask the teacher to leave and for the washroom and probably not come back. Uh, started off with a paper route at a young age. Uh, then I went into uh, a co-op program at a local store here in Toronto called Sporting Life. There's now probably four or five of these stores, but it was uh, uh, a family run store and they weren't based on commission. So they took product knowledge and customer service very, very seriously. In fact, every day before our shift, a, a, a partner like Nike or Adidas, someone came in and, and gave us some type of product knowledge, or they brought in people from a customer service perspective. So I started to learn the importance of customer service at that time. I was probably 16 years old, um, like grade 11, grade 12. Um, and, and then after that, I went into banking as a uh, sales and service specialist. So at the time, it was just at the start of online banking slash telephone banking. Went into car sales for two and a half, three years. And I always wanted to get into real estate, invest into real estate. Um, I actually went in and got my license thinking they were going to teach me how to invest. 
I quickly learned it was it's more of a course so you don't get sued, which is obviously important as a as a as a registered broker. Um, and then I, I got into the business 15 years ago and uh, never looked back. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right, so. Number one, Royal Page team in Canada for 2019. Like, was that always the goal, like, like the ambition, or was that accomplishment just simply like the outcome of your execution and like where the chips just happened to lay? A little bit of both. Uh, we definitely, uh, when we came on to uh, Royal Page about 11 years ago, so REC stands for Real Estate Center. We had our own brokerage. I say we, it was myself, uh, Simeon, and a third partner who's now passed away uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, we had our own brokerage, the Real Estate Center. Got to Royal LePage about 11 years ago. At that time, when we came to Royal LePage, we were uh, number 39. So, like, that's where statistically they would have put us at that time out of out of the 18, probably 17,000 at that time. And so, obviously, the goal was always to become number one within our organization. Our, our major goal is to be number one in the world. I mean, we like to think big. We want to be the biggest brokerage. However, keeping our culture still very much intact. Um, to the put to your point, is that where the chips kind of just started to lay, lay themselves out? Yes, for sure. We we it took us about two years to get from thirty nine to twenty two or twenty three. Then we flirted around 14, 15 to about seven for seven years. Uh, where we were kind of moving back and forth from 15 to 7. It's a, it's a very competitive organization. 2018, we were number three, and we were like, look, this is right around the corner now. We just need to push ourselves a little bit more. Our team of 25 realtors, um, they really are second to none in the greater Toronto market. Uh, they, they, they go at it every single day. Uh, six, seven days a week. Uh, they have clients that are very, very loyal and supportive. And we were awarded number one last year. Huge. That's amazing. So that, that's interesting. I want to talk about like the execution part of it all. So um, a lot of your content that you put out, like you, you obviously incorporate like real estate into it, of course, but it's not all about real estate. And, you know, this is something I say all the time to realtors on this podcast and to my clients and stuff is like, a big mistake that I see a lot of realtors make is that um, all the content they put out is just about listings and the market and like what they just sold or like what they're currently listing, which is great. But the reality is like most people that are consuming that, that content, like don't really care about that. Like most people aren't currently in the market to buy or sell like right now. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 you know. I think we just, we, we as consumers and look, we as realtors are also consumers in other for other industries. And I don't know what the last stat is, but about five years ago, so, so somebody from, I don't know if it was Harvard or Yale, came up with a stat that we, um, as, as the general public, get about 10,000 marketing messages every single day. Our brain is quite good at filtering out a lot of these marketing messages. And so if all you're doing, in my opinion, as a realtor coming out with, just listed, just sold, it will start to get a little bit boring and something that not everybody's going to want to see all the time, especially if they're not even thinking about being in the market. And so about two, a little over 20 months or so 22 months, we started a massive campaign of and, and, and vision of becoming the authority through branding. And so high level was, we're just going to talk. And I kind of became the face of it where I'm going to talk about everything that I like. Well, what do I like? I like building businesses. I like building team culture. I like leadership because as I mentioned about school, I don't have a formal education. So I learned through audiobooks and podcasts and, and, and listening to guys like Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield and the list goes on and on. And I said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and talk to leaders in, in not only our industry, but all walks of life and allow the public to be a, a, you know, a, a fly on the wall of these conversations that we're having. What started to happen is I started to connect with people on a different level. It no longer was about real estate. So if you're listening or watching this podcast right now, guys and gals, I would strongly, strongly recommend A, Start talking. And I don't care if it's about root beer, uh, uh, the Leafs, the Raptors, 
uh, fashion, cars, whatever it is, because people that are interested in those similar topics will start to connect with you. And this business is all about meeting people. So from a higher level, wherever you can meet people, that's a good thing. And then the byproduct becomes real estate or mortgage or insurance or whatever car sales, whatever you're, whatever you're trying to sell or whatever product or service you're trying to sell. Totally right. I totally agree. And, you know, I think, uh, again, back to what you just said earlier about, I think the best marketers nowadays and real estate agents or realtors, they're, you know, you're, you're a marketing company at the end of the day. And like, you got to be able to understand human behavior, and like what resonates with people. And you're right. If you just keep doing like the same old, like just listed, just sold like that, that it becomes annoying for people after some time. So yeah, I like what you said there. Just start talking about any of your interests and that, that definitely will connect with, and, with and, people. And, and Kasa, look, man, add in the real estate stuff, but maybe don't make it always so promotional, like uh, all about you. And this is really going back to real estate ads, you know, going back to 50, 60 years ago. Really, once, once realtors started um, marketing even in newspapers, you'll notice that the picture of the house is this small, but the picture of the agent is this big. Yeah. You're there to sell the home and help people buy, sell, or invest. And so the con- some of the content that you can speak about is how does somebody buy a home? What are the costs? Um, what's involved in selling a home? How does someone invest? And what we started to do, and guys, this is very easy for you to do as well, is if you think about it from the perspective of teaching people how to do it on their own, of the time, they'll never do it on their own. Like, for example, if you teach people how to sell their own home, we in Canada know that the national statistic is only 2% of people sell their home through like for sale by owner sites or, 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 or like really discount brokerages. At the end of the day, they're going to look at who was the one that was giving me the advice the whole time. I always tell a funny story that if my car broke down, I probably in all honesty, have no passion in fixing a spark plug or fixing uh, or changing the oil or even changing the tire. I might leave the car there and just call my my car salesman who who gives me a lot of value and say, hey, buddy, hook me up with a new car. I left mine in the middle of 401. I have no passion in fixing anything, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, that that makes a lot of sense. So um, I want to try and unpack that a little bit. So you, your team sold, you said 700 or 700 mm-hmm. transactions in 700 transactions. So transactions. Appro- approximately 275 to 300 were with investors. We're a very investor focused firm. In fact, myself, um, um, that's what I primarily focus on. So when my, bro- when my cousin or my brother or my uncle calls and says they want to sell their home, someone on my team um, w- w- would be able to take care of them. Okay, perfect. So yeah, 700 transactions, investment focus, like you said, that's crazy. Um, I want to try and like reverse engineer that for our audience. Like, so to be involved with that many deals, obviously you have to have a lot of prospects and leads just flow through your funnel and your pipeline and just have a big enough reach. Um, you know, we know a significant part, if not, I don't know, all of your marketing strategy is is content driven and like producing Bang content. On. Bang so, on. You know, Talk about that. Talk about your marketing strategy, particularly on the content side of things and, and how you see an, our, an actual ROI from producing all this content. Yeah. So, so we, for the last 15 years, have, build, have been in the process of building a, a, a quite extensive and qualified, um, not only investor list, but just a list of people that want to stay in touch with us. We've always practiced what we call permission-based marketing. It's a phenomenal book by none other than uh, uh, really the like the top guy in marketing, which is Seth, who's Seth Godin. Pick up his book. It's a phenomenal book. So we don't spam anyone. We always ask people the, the question, hey, are you okay with um, uh, uh, giving, our, us, giving us your opinion on the marketing we're doing? And 99.9% of people will say yes. And over time, we've built a, a, a list of now a little over 5,000 people that say yes. You can email us a couple of times a month. And give us a call every every quarter just to check in on us. And so, along the uh, uh, along that fifteen years, what we started to do a lot of is it events. So we would invite people to inv- uh, events and teach them how to invest into real estate, 
how to sell their own home, how to invest their, uh, sorry, how to buy their own home. We came out with a guide that's right behind me. And if any one of your listeners or viewers want it, make sure that it's a free book. Um, it teaches people, there's a chapter in there, how to, t- how to sell your own home. So we give away all the value up front. And two years ago, we started the podcast. And so the podcast, and because you asked the, uh, what's the return on the investment, it really, it really comes down to, it gave our REC insiders, that number of a little over 5,000, something to talk about to people that they knew. Because they already trusted us in some manner. They either said they've either used our service to buy, sell, or invest, or even help them from a renting perspective or renting out one of their properties. Or what now it gave them, it gave them the artillery to, when they speak to their cousin, Charlie, hey, go check out REC. It's, a, it's an easy way to get free information. And that was through our content. Love it. Love it. Do you, you talk about like just providing value and like, opening up your your playbook essentially um are you cautious or like worried of the you know your competitors just like taking you know what you're putting out and and copying your playbook essentially no look like this book it took i don't know years for us to put it together we change it every year or so because rules change if there's a an agent listening or watching uh, just give us a call we'll mail it out to you i don't care where you are in the world and you can literally take it and reword it and reuse it. Because here's the thing: I, I learned a long time ago. First of all, there's only going to be there's going to be thousands and thousands of people listening to this and watching. Only one or two are ever going to do what I I said uh, to do, right? Like, yeah. no one's going to put in the time. However, uh, that's, someone, yeah, you you know that, Carlos. Like you, you've been that's what I was getting at. That's what I was sort of getting at. Because like I, I know the same thing. It's like you provide all this value, show people exactly what you're doing. But like you said, most people are just consumers at the end of the day. Like they're not going to actually what, execute on. My 25 realtors, out of my 25 realtors, there's only five or seven that have actually even printed this book. I've literally packaged it up for them. And it cost them $3.38, okay, to print and a dollar fifty to mail out, okay, with the packaging. And my own, my own team hasn't used it yet, right? Because so, so it, it just goes to show that I know most people are not going to do it. Also, on top of that, I'm so I have such tunnel vision that I'm only thinking about what we can do better, what we do well, and what we can do better. What the competition does, I know there's people doing more than us, but I also know there's people doing less than us. I, I don't spend actually, I probably spend no time on thinking about the competition. I don't have sure, enough of sure. it. I don't have enough of I don't have enough time. Like just literally before you and I got on this call, I had a meeting with uh, kind of my internal sales team. And after we finish, I think I have, a, I have a meeting with my content creator. I have a meeting with my video. Like it just goes on and on and on. Um, the competition, th- there'll be always people that have more than me. There'll be always people that have less. I'm grateful and blessed to have what I have, which in turn, I know gives me more. Yeah. You're totally right. I I totally agree. And I I get that question as well. Like, you know, the competition, like, what do you think about this competitor? And it's like, honestly, like, yeah, you're you're mindful of what's going on in your market. But at the end of the day, you know, you're just focused on providing value to your clients and like potential clients. And like the rest is just noise. It doesn't matter, right? One one thing that we added, and and I say it on podcasts and videos and and my, our organization, uh, Royal LePage Signature, which is the franchise, is a thousand realtors deep. Um, they ask us to come in and speak about some of the stuff that we are up to. So about two, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I should say, to be exact, we added um, a real estate concierge division to our organization. And so it allows our clients now to have access to a uh, uh, a concierge, Tyler, who's kind of also my air traffic control guy, they can call him, email, text him and say, look, I have a lease agreement that I'm doing in um, downtown Toronto. I need a plumber. I need an electrician. I need a painter and Tyler's job. Or they can also say, just to add to it, there's someone in Saskatchewan I need. I need a mover in Saskatchewan. His full-time job is to go find a mover in Saskatchewan, a place that we don't do really any business in, just to add that add that value added service to our clients and we don't charge anyone for it. It's absolutely free. It's been the, one of the biggest game changers in our business because 
what he does is he'll call our clients, those are like the REC insiders every, every quarter and just say, Hey, Costa, I'm checking in on you, man. Did you need anything from me today from a real estate perspective? No, Tyler, I didn't need anything or Tyler. I need, I did. My cousin needed a painter in Vancouver. He'll go and find that person. Now that I have you on the phone, Costa, did you have an appetite for another investment property? It revolutionized our business. Yeah, that's huge. It, yeah, I can. It, it costs a lot of time and effort and money because he's off. He's because he's doing that. He's not able to do anything else. That's his full time job. And if I show you, like he's just right across me, so I'm looking at him. He's waving his hands. He's on a phone call, <laughs> doing the same thing, right? That I'm talking about. Um, but it again allows us to be slightly different than whatever else is in the marketplace. Now, I never thought that uh, uh, somebody else was doing that. It literally just came into my head. I have a team member, uh, Laura, who's our director of sales and marketing. She used to work for a concierge uh, service and like a traditional concierge service. And I was like, hey, that'd be kind of cool if we can add that to our to to to, to our organization. And like I said, it, it literally changed our business. Yeah, that, that's that's a great idea. Yeah, it's all about adding the, the value added services and those definitely go a long way. Um, what do you say to the agents who, who say like, you know, they're new, they're just starting out, they don't have a team, they don't have the time to produce all this content and do all this stuff, or like don't have the money to hire people, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you get that question a lot, but like, what do you say to those people? Like if someone wanted to start producing all this content and like work on their branding, um, how can they realistically start? So the first thing I would say is that you're, you're already starting off on the wrong foot, Mr. and Mrs. New Agent, because you, you, you came to me with all the things that you can't do. Let's start with the right mindset and say, okay, look, this is what I want to do. And we know it's been done before. You use the word earlier. I use it 40 times a day. Let's reverse engineer it now and just work backwards from there. So you can make time. You can build a team. You can hire people. We, we're not saying you need to do all this all in one day. Rome was not built in one day. This is going to take some time. You have to have lots of patience. But if there's someone who just got their license yesterday, I think the best advice I can give you is right now, like even stop listening to this podcast. I'm sorry, Costa, you're going to lose a listener or a viewer. But stop listening or watching and find yourself an assistant. That is by far the big, like, the biggest tip I can give you, and I'll tell you why. Because in, most people say, I can't afford to do it. No, you cannot not afford to do it. Because once you have an assistant, it's, you, you've now bought back 40 hours of your time every single week. And here you can get a very, very qualified assistant. I don't know which marketplace you're in, but you can pay someone $16, $17, $18 an hour. Okay. By them helping you do a lot of the work that you really shouldn't be doing because in this business and more, I, like I know you have some mortgage brokers that listen and watch because our, 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 our businesses are so similar. There's really only two things you should be worried about every single day. It's just how are you going to meet people and how are you going to help them buy, sell, or invest? Everything else at some point needs to be delegated out. And so, for example, my assistant allows me to do so much more, get on a phone, uh, Zoom call with, and do a podcast with you, S do more of the higher level conversations with our clients. But so you're going to pay $16, $17 an hour. Let's call it $30,000 a year. Understand that the average person knows 200 people. So if you add the, the, the assistance network into your database now, chances are they're going to come in with them knowing 200 people. At 200 people, let's just use a very low return on the investment of, let's say, 5%. I usually work off of anywhere 10 to 12%, but let's say 5%. You bring in 200 people, that's 10 deals that you should get either referred to you or out of their own, out of that assistance network should do deals. 10 deals in any marketplace is close to a hundred, like $10,000 gross commission. Let's work off of a slower, like a lower number at 7,000. That's $70,000 you just added to your, your, your income for the year. You paid them 30,000, you netted out $40,000. And you also got back 40 hours of your life. So for example, I haven't been on MLS for four to five years. 
I have not signed on MLS for four to five years. I don't even have a laptop cost. I haven't touched the laptop. <laughs> wow. Get what I'm saying? I like all the content that we produce, it's, it's, it's produced by, like it's made by me, but all the rest of the team, it puts it together, does all the editing, but going back to a newer agent. Now you have that extra 40 hours. So when you get a phone call from a client that says, Costa, how do I, uh, uh, what's the closing cost for a lawyer? You're going to answer that question via call, text, or email. And then you're going to shoot a piece of video answering that question. Hey guys, just got a call from uh, my client. You don't need to say the name. And uh, they were asking what's the closing cost. Well, the closing costs in Toronto when you're buying a new home are X and Y. You have the video. You can also rip up the audio and just make it into a podcast. A podcast doesn't need to be like this. It doesn't need to be 30 minutes. I do, I do, I do three minute audio clips every single day. Yeah. They're just like literally value added clips. You then can write the exact same answer from your video and put that out on LinkedIn, put that on medium.com. Not a lot of people know medium.com. It has 150 million users every single month. Now with that one call that you had to take or that text from a client, you just repurposed it to four different pieces of micro content. Yeah. See, the question is not that if we have the time or not, the question is, do you want to make the time? Do you believe in yourself to go get that assistant before you're actually making any money? I, and guys, whoever is listening, getting an assistant is not a, like, you have to, if you're serious, if you're part-time in this business, I, 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 like, I'm not speaking to you. If you're full-time getting into this business, the first thing that you need to do is get an assistant. I haven't even printed anything in the last, like, five years. Why would I do that? I need to think about ideas and, and ways of getting not one person to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, but how am I going to get 30 people in a room? Because when I talk to them on how to buy, sell, and invest, me speaking to one person or 30 people, it's the exact same thing. You know, like, like I, I, it's going to take the exact same amount of time. Now, if I can get 30 people in a room, chances are three to five are going to do a transaction just out of that room. You need to yeah. make the time. I love it. Yeah. Everything you're saying, it's, it's honestly so simple, so logical, but it, it goes back to the first thing you said, and it starts with your mindset. And I, I think it's everything the, right in here, right? The biggest, here. Yeah. I think the biggest limitation people have is right here. It's in their own mind and it's just like escaping that and just, you know, thinking look, very, very logically. And, 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 and I'm not audacious enough to think that somebody's going to listen to this podcast and change their life, but we all, we all grew up with limiting beliefs, right? And, and all yeah. different ones, right? Like money doesn't grow on trees. Who do you think you are? You know, that, that, that's one that we all, a lot of us heard. And so don't waste it. Don't spend, like people think getting an assistant is a waste of money because we're like, well, you can do that stuff. But we're talking business. You can't be doing that type of stuff. You cannot, sure. right? You need to think of ways of how to, and the, as I mentioned earlier, what really revolutioned, revolutionized our business was doing events because instead of meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, we I love having a couple of drinks on a Wednesday or Thursday night. Glass of wine, yeah. I probably go more towards the vodka and soda, <laughs> um, a glass of scotch. And I said, look, why don't we just do that on scale? So we just started putting on events and some of our events have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with real estate. We actually do, do, do something called REC pub nights where we just invite people to a bar and have some beers. I think it has more to do with the fact that I didn't go to university. So I never went to those pub nights. And so now I want to start on my own. Um, and so we started doing REC pub nights and just doing events, just bringing people because inevitably they'll always ask the question, how's the market? What's happening in real estate? So it doesn't always have to be about the five top mistakes that investors make. It doesn't have to be always real estate related. For sure. It's a relationship business at the end of the day, right? Um, and, and that's why I, I say the, the only two things that a new realtor or a seasoned realtor needs to get back to is thinking about how can you meet more people and just help them buy, sell, and invest. Everything in between should be delegated out. And I can tell you, I make more money now than I've ever had with having more payroll. I've never had this type of payroll. I have 10 people on, on staff that get their paycheck every two weeks. 
and and but I'm doing a lot more deals because I can just get so much more done. And it also gives me time to think about the bigger ideas like, OK, and in two years, I want to be on stage talking about something or um, I'm in the process of writing a book. And my ghostwriter said, like, you don't give me any time anymore to even write this book because our deadline was at the end of 2020. And she mentioned, like, uh, the way that you're going now, we're not going to finish this. So I had to literally revamp my schedule just to make sure I got in three days a week. First thing in the morning when we're both kind of we're, we're, we're a lot more creative at that time. But it allows me to do that because I don't have to worry about an email going out. I don't have to worry about phone calls going out. I don't have to worry about the video editing. I do need to shoot the video, but this podcast, I'm going to split into probably 15 micro pieces of content, minimal. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. That, that's amazing. Um, I, I'm curious to hear uh, your perspective on this. So uh, real estate, as you know, it's, it's a very high turnover business. Like a lot of agents uh, come, come in and, and go, you know, as I'm sure you've seen over the years, uh, I can see a lot of people again to real estate, especially in the GTA. Um, just thinking it's, it's something to, to make some quick money, um, being one of the hottest markets in the world and just seeing, you know, this bull run for the last couple of decades, if not more, mm -hmm. and just people making money. But uh, those people like soon realize that I, like, shit, this isn't easy as I thought. Like I got to put in a serious amount of work to be successful in real estate. So that causes turnover and people give up easy. But I think fundamentally that comes from people simply just not having patience. And something I always say, um, people nowadays, you're just seeing more and more of it. Just people want to get to the finish line without running the race. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I see it and hear it all the time, not only from people in the business, but even investors. Like, specifically in the GTA, like, how do I make the quick buck? Well, real estate and investing just, just doesn't allow for that. Real estate is the get rich slow process. There is no get rich quick scheme in real estate investing. From a business perspective, I, I've yet to come across any business that where, where, where the owner, the founder didn't have to put in a lot of time. I just don't get what the rush is. See, Maybe it comes down to the fact that 50 years ago, 70 years ago, being 50 years old meant like you're old. Being like 50 is nothing now. We're, we're yeah. living, you know, we're living, the, the expectancy is it, for both males and females has shot through the roof, right? I think the average male now lives to like 87 or something like that, right? And so at yeah. 50, you still have like a good, good 25 years, half of what you've already done. Right. Yeah. So at 38, for example, I know I got two more lives still left, Bang, like knock on wood. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, knowing that the second I came like the second I really, really, really understood that I was like, I got two more lives left. OK, I everything can take some time now. So I had on Friday and, and, and here I'm taking it down to the micro level, like because I have staff, I have to deal with my staff's life problems as well, because that's just normal. I had one of my staff and I needed him last week. Friday or uh, Thursday, couldn't come in. He was feeling sick. I had someone today, first thing in the morning, I, my copywriter needed him. He's not coming in. He's feeling sick. Instead of me thinking, holy crap, my staff's letting me down. It was like, well, if they get well, I'm gonna, they're going to produce a lot better later on. All my guys go and gals go through their own personal stuff, but I have the patience. I got a lot of time left. And so when you come to the realization that you have an ex, another life left, you have you know, two years, even if you're 65, you still got another good 15, 20 years left. Imagine what you can do with that time. Yeah, you're totally right. I totally agree. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of these like online courses now that people are just eating up, like, you know, make a million dollars in 30 days. It's like, there's no substitute for, for that hard work and that grind. Like you said, you know what, also, like, I, I, even in my business, I see, and I get asked a lot. In fact, a, a DM came in today to my team saying, um, do you, do you, do you have a course on mentoring uh, investors? Two, uh, two days ago, I got one from a real estate, a realtor saying, Hey, like, do you have a coaching? I'm like, no, just go to the podcast. I've given everything that I know. In yeah. fact, like some people would say, Jazz, like you could tell like if they unfollow you or something or they'll leave me a comment like, dude, you're just always talking about the same stuff. I know, but I'm not going to talk about things I don't know. And so like 
I don't, I don't knock anybody for monetizing or, or, or even my, within my team. They're like, Hey, Jess, should we start selling this course? And I'm like, no, like, what are we going to do? Sell a 20, uh, 1999, uh, uh, a month course or a hundred dollar a month course to me, it's short term. I want to build up a lot more brand and authority and then I can ask right now. I actually, I'm not, I don't have the, the, the you know what to even ask yet. Cause I don't believe I've built, I've given enough value yet. I'm in the yeah. process of it that I know. And I'm just going to wait as long as I possibly can. I think where I might win is that I'm willing to hold my breath longer than most other people because the truth of the matter is I'm from Rexdale. Like we had nothing, you know, like, like we grew up with not a lot. Like I have two older brothers. My parents gave as much as they possibly could, but like all this is way more than I ever dreamed of. And so now I can wait. Now I can really, really wait. And I actually think that's what really makes me very, very deadly in the business world because I think I'm going to be able to give a lot because now my team, like the culture has is spreading. I'm watching it where my director of sales and my director of concierge services, they spend more time with my new interns and my new executive assistant than I do about talking about culture. Now that now it's starting to spread. Now I think we're going to become really, really deadly in the next two to five years. Like at the end of the day, yeah. there's a lot worse that can happen, right? So For it's sure. really hard to kind of screw with my mindset because at, I'll just take it right back down to like, well, I'm eating. Like I can, after, at lunch, I'm probably going to buy a lunch that's $12, $13. Like there's people that don't have food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's totally. really, really basic to me. Now, you know, you've been in the real estate business a long time, 15 years, you said? 15 years at sales and service for 25 years, yeah. Okay, perfect. So a lot of the listeners on, on this podcast uh, are newer agents. So like, if you had to pinpoint maybe two or three characteristics or traits that make up a successful realtor, in your opinion, uh, what would those be? I think you need to smile um, 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 because I, I, I speak to a lot of people on, on the phone and you can hear a smile through a phone call. Like I just, I'm a true, true believer of it. And so you have to have a positive outlook, right? And, and even on days that are tough, you need to be, you need to know that the sun will come out the next day and there's some hard times and there might be a time where you, you go into multiple offers, you lose uh, uh, a multiple offer bid for your buyer. You go in for a listing appointment, you don't get the business. You don't get the listing. You just got to keep on going. You have to persevere. So number one is, is mindset. Going back to that, your mindset is that you are, once you know that you're going to, 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 to make it happen, you can come, you can become very, very unstoppable. You got to put in the work. You got to have to, you got to put in the work. This is not a, 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 a job or a business where you can put in three or four hours a day. It doesn't need to be 13, 14 like I do, but there has to be somewhere in the middle there. And, and then I think third is, is be okay with letting go of business. Stop mm -hmm. chasing your own tail. Not You don't have to go right across the greater Toronto area. There is riches in the niches. Do just condos in Liberty Village. Become the expert. Become the known person. It might take two, three years to build that brand and that authority, but be okay to let go business. I have let go of clients because what they were looking for was unreasonable, or we just didn't jive and life's too short for that, man. Like, like, in that aspect, life's too short for that. Like, let it go. And oh, what happened is, as I actually got more business in, because I was willing to let some of that business go. Yeah, that's an important one. Letting go of business. Um, I also would, would throw in. I, I've, I've uh, seen a lot of realtors almost um, be entitled. You know, just because they have a family member or a friend that they they think they're entitled to get their business. Um, and they get angry and upset and relationships are, you know, ruined. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I, it comes down to one thing for me. I live by the principles of plenty when it comes into real, like any sales, as I mentioned, sales of service, 25 years. I knew that I needed to knock on as many doors as I possibly can when I was selling the Toronto Sun. And I knew majority of people were going to say no, but it was just a matter of time until someone said yes. In, in At the bank, it was the job was taking inbound calls. So you would call to pay your bill. But my, 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 me having a job there was based on the fact if I could 
talk to you about setting up a line of credit, a mortgage, a loan. It was a matter of me just asking enough people. The bank was very, it was a lot easier because I took in a hundred calls a day and that was just me. In car sales, you need to speak to enough people to get someone to purchase a car. Real estate is no different. Yeah. You need to always have 10 working files, in my opinion. So when you're starting out, so you just got your license today, you're going to get, you're going to find that agent, uh, sorry, that, that assistant, as I mentioned. And then your job is to have 10 working files with you at all times. What do I mean? 10 buyers, sellers, or investors. And when one buys or one says, because they bought with their cousin, Charlie, then you're okay. You still have nine left. Your job is to get the 10th. So you're always just thinking about principles of plenty because it doesn't matter if one or two drop out, you have enough. I've been there. I've been there when my, my first blood cousin in my first two years of the business used me to actually like, use my services to show him homes, but then always knew he had a property that he was going to buy privately. But he never told me that. And he did. And I was peeved. However, I got once I got over and understood, well, it's all my fault because I didn't give enough value. And now, why do I like at that time? Once I came to the realization, well, you know what? I just need more. I just need a Costa. I need a Tyler. I need a Laura. I need a Sham. I just need more buyers, sellers, and investors. When one when one drops off, it's okay. There's still a, another nine to go. Sticking to that topic, though, in terms of characteristics and traits of a realtor, uh, what about entrepreneurship? Like, do you think? Realtors should be entrepreneurs or have to be like that business mind? No, actually, I, I, I don't think you have to. However, to be the realtor, like if you're going to be the head of your team or if you're just a realtor yourself, you have to have some type of entrepreneurial tendencies because here's what it really comes down to. You need to have the stomach to hear all the notes. You need to have the stomach when you don't get a paycheck for six months. You can be, you can have a lot of empathy. You can be very happy. You can, you can be very positive. But for me, what an entrepreneur has different, not better or worse, just different than other, uh, 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 like people in other industries is having a stomach for it. Now, yeah. my director of sales and marketing, I always bring her up because she spends a lot of time with us, is um, she, she, by trade, she had her uh, MBA in marketing. She got her license to become uh, a realtor in the luxury division. She tried it out for a couple of years um, and, and decided that she was a lot better in being a director, which helps our clients in the pre-construction stage go through the 10-day cool, uh, cooling period. She makes a lot more than I personally believe that she would have if she was just a realtor. Why? Because she added so much value, so much value, change it literally creating new systems for us. So yeah. you don't have to be an entrepreneur to be in the real estate business because there's other roles that you can take on. But I think in my position, yeah, you need to be an entrepreneur. Like you have to have some entrepreneur tendencies because you need to come up with the ideas. You need to create the ideas. You need to have the stomach for them when they don't work out. I want to ask you this, and it's interesting, um, about technology and, and coming, uh, hearing the answer from someone who doesn't even own a laptop, like you said. Uh, I want to ask you about technology. So, so how are you using or how's your team using technology in your business? And how do you see technology changing real estate in, say, the next five to 10 years? Well, I, uh, to answer your first question about how my team is using technology, I mean, they all have the, uh, the most up-to-date laptops and my, the media squad, the REC media squad has, um, I don't even know, like these Apple computers, like all that, like they have all the up-to-date stuff, cameras, we have tons of we have like four or five cameras we have wireless mics um i personally use a samsung note um because it just made my life very very easy we we chat um all of our chats and our workflows are all done through whatsapp um we send all of our drive links so all my team will post produce all the from a content perspective and then just send me a google link drive um with with all the content that i can pick and choose for whatever I feel like to use in that specific day. Um, so our team uses technology uh, every single day. How is it going to change the real estate industry? It's already changed it. Um, there's, there's, there's companies out there that um, only, do, uh, only help buyers and sellers through online services, and it's going to come more. There's going to be more of it. I do think, though, there still will always be a place for high touch 
sales, really in real in any industry, real estate, car sales, insurance, because people at when they're spending that type of money, they need to feel and touch a person. Now, what technology does is cut out kind of the middleman. So if you're not offering high-end service, then you might be you might be out of the business because technology will just get rid of you. They're not you're not needed because you're not offering anything that's much more valuable. And so there's already there's already online brokerages that are around, um, some that have come and gone, and some that are still here. And look, if you don't think that Jeff Bezos is sitting somewhere right now thinking about how to take over the real estate industry, you're naive. Like this guy is the best business mind. At like of all time, arguably speaking, and the one, the one that he's somewhat touched in, in, in over in the state side, he's gonna, he's gonna figure this out because he's, yeah. he's done it to every other industry. So yeah. if you can take over the, the bookstores. Don't worry, he's coming, he's coming into the real. <laughs> yeah, you, you answered the, the next thing I want to ask is about um, the human element of real estate, and do you think that will ever go away? But. Um, yeah, look, I, 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 I don't in, in, like it. Possibly will unless you offer high value service. So what does that mean? Like, get back to your clients. So to the newer realtors, don't be surprised when you if you call another realtor, they don't get back to you for a couple of days. That's just known in the business. But you got to make sure you get back to your clients. Don't be pushy. Like, don't be a pushy salesperson. Um, offer them extra services that you that. That might cost you money, but in turn, they'll come back to you to do more business. So, look, I, I, I don't think that uh, there's going to be a point in time where realtors are not needed. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you there. Uh, Jazz, we're, we're a little bit over time. I do I want to be mindful of your time. I do end off Thank each you. chat with what I call the top three. Awesome. Yeah. All right. No, number one, you mentioned one earlier, a couple, but your favorite book or audio book. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by uh, uh, the late, great Stephen Covey. Uh, read this book about, uh, I'm going to say about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Just changed my outlook on so many different things. It is the, huh, it is not only the book for entrepreneurs, it's the book for any human being. I agree. It's one of my favorites as well. Uh, number two, your favorite vacation spot. Um, other than my couch after a long, hard day of work, I would say Jamaica. Just got back there a couple of uh, got back from there a couple of weeks ago, but I've been there a numerous amount of times. Love the weather, love the people, and more importantly, love the jerk chicken and jerk pork. <laughs> I love it. And uh, lastly, if you can go back, what's the one thing you wish you knew when you were just starting out in real estate? That I have a lot more time than I thought at that time. Love it. Love it. Jazz, thank you so much. This was a great chat. I'm so uh, grateful and thankful that we were able to do this and I hope we can uh, chat again sometime. We definitely will. Thank you so much for having me, Costa. And as I mentioned, um, uh, if there's anything that I can do for your viewers or listeners, just tell them to reach out. Um, and you, to you, Costa, keep doing what you're doing, my man. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Jazz, have a good one. You too, buddy. Take care. Take care. Bye. This has been the REC Experience Podcast with Jazz Takar, an REC Canada production. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening. Please, please take a second right now to subscribe and follow us on whatever podcast platform you're watching or listening. It means the world to me. Thank you.